Hey guys, what's up? It is now late at night. Really late. I should be sleeping because I had a really long day today. It's, it's just been nuts. All the work that I'm trying to cram in before Christmas hits. But, um, nah. Let's be stupid and talk about sword stuff instead. <laughs> Specifically Chinese sword stuff, as I'm pretty sure you guys have guessed from the title. Um, this is something that recently has been bothering me, fairly recently. And, and when I say bother, it's not like, you know, anything, you know, dramatic or, or anything like that. It, it's just more um, something that I hear or read fairly frequently when it comes to the use of the Chinese sword. And while I'm definitely not calling myself an expert or anything, from all the different forms and methods that I've seen people use the sword, you know, how, how the sword's used, I find these assertions on its use to be kind of wrong. Some of you guys make me know what I'm talking about, and many of you don't, so let me get on to it. Basically, when it comes to weapons in Chinese martial arts, there tends to be certain rules that are given to people who are practicing these weapons and these rules generally uh, are not supposed to be broken you know this is usually told to beginners for a reason but generally they're like you know there's like a certain way you're supposed to use each weapon and you're not supposed to use it like another weapon um a, somebody who commented on my videos earlier for instance had a certain saying which to give you an idea of the rules um, the straight sword doesn't cross the brain during usage. Um, the hook sword never enters the elbows. You know, like, stuff like that. Um, but if you want something a little bit more concrete, well, I'll give you an idea. L let's take the dull, the saber, the Chinese saber, or some people call it the broad sword. Um, there are basic ways it's supposed to be used, but in general, people say that it's mostly a hacking weapon. It's a, you know, slashing and cutting weapon. And it's basically used with a lot of vigorous motion. Um, the traditional way of saying it is that it's a weapon that's used with great strength. It's a robust weapon. You use strength and muscular power. Um, the den, the straight sword, they say, oh, that one's one with technique. You know, you use, that one uses internal power. Okay. Um, it, you know, you used to use it with a more, it's a, a weapon that you use with more finesse. Um, you know, the staff, for instance, they say that that's more of a smashing weapon. That one, you know, is the grandfather of other Chinese weapons. And you use it, you know, with a lot of, you know, cunning and power. And you, and so you use basically to smash into your enemy. Um, the spear, they say it's like a coiling dragon. You know, zooms in and out. And you kind of use it almost when your body kind of twists with every thrust of the spear and you know there's a kind of coiling motion that you go with it and this is the, each weapon has its own characteristics and its own way that it's supposed to be used okay fair enough I mean yeah I mean, you wouldn't exactly use a saber the same way you would use a straight sword a straight sword you know is more of a cut and thrust you know a saber is definitely more suited to the to the cut though depending on the shape of the saber you can thrust pretty well with it too you know but I've also noticed a lot of contemporary people who either, whether they practice with the gen or not, or whether they just happen to like it, they say that the weapon can only be used, like, like if they see somebody, for instance, employing a lot of cuts with it, then they'll say something like, no, 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 the gen is primarily thrusting. Some people even go so far to say that you're only supposed to thrust with it. Okay. You obviously haven't been paying too much attention to the forms you practice then if you think it's only a thrusting weapon. To say nothing of the fact that, that let's just say, I, I've complained about this before, but let me just put it out there right now. Anybody who's looking at a gen, especially one that has that's been made the way it's supposed to be made with sharp edges and everything, with the shape of the blade itself and how wide the blade is, and the center of balance where it happens to be on the blade, to then look at that and say, oh, you're only supposed to thrust with it. You're an idiot. Thrusting, weapons that are designed primarily for thrusting are thinner, usually do not have a sharpened edge, and the point of balance is much closer to the handle than on a dent. Usually pr weapons that are primarily for thrusting tend to have the point of balance pretty close to the, the hill, pretty close to the hand guard. Dien, however, 
their point of balance tends to be around four inches from the, like on average, four inches from the handguard, give or take. Some of them have it a little bit closer, mind you, but the ones that have it closer tend to be the ones where they really want a lot of quick flicking motions with the weapon. And the funny thing is you can still kind of do those flicking motions with one with around a four point, you know, a four inch or sometimes even a five inch point of balance. Not all gen are the same, granted, but I rarely have seen one balance to be similar to, like, say, a rapier, which is what a lot of people compare it to. It's not a rapier, people. It's a cut and thrust sword. And the forms that are, are practiced with it have a lot of motions like this. I mean, the camera's kind of close, so you can't really tell. But there's a lot of cutting motions, a lot of slicing motions. You don't do that with a weapon that you're primarily thrusting with. Use your brain, okay? It, just the, the way the weapon is designed itself tells you that it lends itself pretty well to the cut. Is the cut your primary way of using it? No. I mean, if I was gonna, if I was gonna give you like a basic ratio, I would say, okay, maybe it's sixty percent thrust, forty percent cut, give or take. And some people might argue with me on that. Some people might say it's more fifty-fifty, whatever. Bottom line is, it can cut. But I'm kind of getting a little bit off topic of what I actually wanted to talk about. What this video is actually going to be on. Some people, like I said, it's primarily they say it's primarily a thruster. I consider those guys idiots. I'm sorry, but I do. Um. Then there are those who, they have no problem with it cutting or slicing, but the manner in which you use the sword, they say it's only got to be done one way, especially a lot of contemporary people. It has, it has to have a certain graceful, flowing movement to it. It's kind of hard for me to put in, in the words. It's generally like, if you're cutting with it, they don't expect you to cut with it the same way that you would use like, like a saber, like you know, just hacking down. And, I, and I, I, I don't like the term hack because it makes it sound like it's a clumsy motion, and it's not really. But it's, you know, generally, if you, you know, if you're cutting with a with a dial, you're doing it with, you know, a really vigorous motion, you know. And they say you're not supposed to perform it the same way. Like some people complain. I've seen some people employ the gen like a dial. It's not the way you're supposed to use it. You know. Yeah, generally, yeah. I mean, like for instance, that that wrapping motion that you you sometimes see, well, you, you always see with the dial. You don't really do that with a gen. That's not a good idea for a lot of reasons. You really don't. But like in the way the weapon is you, um, employed, the way you deploy it, you know, it's, they say there's a certain deftness of motion that you're supposed to use. There's, there's a certain lightness to the way it's supposed to use. And it, it flows, it slices, it, you know, it flicks, it flips through the air, like, you know, it, it dances through the air and all that type of stuff. And yeah, that's all nice and good. But um, funny thing is, the more I've been looking at different ways that people use it, the more I'm seeing that that notion is not necessarily true. Is it a good idea to employ it that way? Yeah. But is it the end all the be all of how it's supposed to be employed? Not really. To give you guys an idea of what I'm talking about, I'm going to cut away from myself now and I'm going to show you three forms. Each one is done by somebody who knows what they're doing with the weapon and they all hail from different styles. And they're all pretty much employing the sword, more or less, I'm not gonna say more or less, no, they are performing it correctly. And they're showing some competent skill with the weapon. But what I want you guys to do is pay very close attention to how this sword is being used. Really pay attention to it. And I'm, I'm of course gonna do some commentary a little bit on it. And then when we get back here, well, We'll discuss it some more. So, here we go. Three forms. The three forms that I'm going to be showing you, by the way, one is a form from the famous Wudan Mountain. It's a Wudan form. I think it's a new one, to be honest with you. Fairly new one. Newish. Um, when I say new, I'm like, you know, it, it, I think it was developed probably sometime in the 20th century. If it was before that, I'd be surprised. Like, I'm, I kind of doubt it. But it does follow correct principles. It's a really nice form. The next one I'm going to show you is a Xingyi form. And the third one, I'm going to call it a Taoist form. Some people call it a Wudan form. It's, it's hard for me to describe, but it's, it, it, it's more of a folk style type one. And I want you guys to notice how the weapons are employed. So let's get on with it. So here's the first form. This one happens to be called Wudan Danjian or the Wudan Cinnabar Sword. 
Now, note how this one is employed. Sita has kind of like a flowing Tai Chi-like movement to it. That anybody who practices Tai Chi should automatically recognize those first basic steps before it becomes a little bit more lively. This particular form actually seems to marry um, basic motions from Tai Chi and Bagua, maybe even a little bit of Xin in it. But this is not surprising considering that this is a Wudan form and, as I said, this is a more modern sword form. Notice how it just flows. There's very light, dainty movements with it, which is what people tend to expect when this weapon is being used. Though there's a little bit more flow with this style than I usually see with other, shall I say, typical sword forms. There's still, I mean, there's a liveliness to it, but it's really, you know, there's definitely a slow flow to it. By the way, this guy's cheating. That's not the whole form. <laughs> there's a whole other half to it. Oh, well. Now, let's take a look at this one. This one is a Xinyi style. It's a Xinyi sword form, and it's known as Linked Swords. Right away, notice how this one's being employed. This guy doesn't seem to be dainty with it at all, does he? Let's ignore the fact that he's using a sword with a whippy blade. Let's just forget that sin. But just notice how he's performing it. It's very brisk. It's very direct. There's a lot of hard stopping here. Also, note that at this point, if you've been paying attention, he's repeating the same motions that he did just before. So he's not just performing the sword. It's like he's performing a drill, which is actually more akin to how forms, Chinese forms used to be used. There were drills on basic motions and techniques. But again, this one is decidedly different from the first one I showed, isn't it? It's very direct, very practical looking. Not a lot of dance with this one. And now this last one is also a Wudan form, but from a different branch, and it's called the Rainbow Sword. Now, I want you to notice how she practices this form. This, this is, again, a different form. And it's a Wudan one, so you would expect it to be performed the same way as the first one I showed you, right? But it's not the same, is it? You don't see any of that slow flow there. It seems to be more direct than the first one, but it's not as direct and brisk as the second one, is it? It's not as brisk as the Xinyi form. In fact, and so, notice the way she's using the sword, the for, um, her sword, sometimes it doesn't even slice the same way. Some motions, it almost looks like she's straight up hitting the guy with the sword. But, I mean, there is enough slice and cut, but just... This is a decidedly different method, isn't it? I mean, the basics are generally there. It's not as if she's using the sword in any wrong way or anything like that. She's definitely not using it like a saber, but it's not the same, is it? And notice her left hand. It's not even in that traditional sword finger position either. So is this wrong? Of course not. It's just different. Okay, guys. So, notice that they're done differently, don't you? They're not the same. The ways that this weapon is used is not the same. Let's start with the Wudan one. Like I saw, that one, even though some people say that's kind of the stereotypical way you normally would see it, it's not really a stereotypical way. Notice that there's a lot of emphasis on body movement in how the weapon is used. The power is definitely coming from the waist and from very flowing fluid motions when the sword is used. It's not, you know, I, I, there's a certain lightness in the wrist that I tend to see when other people perform it. And while it's there, there's a kind of, you know, there's a little bit of a, a kind of flowing heaviness to the way the Wudan guys use the sword. Like, you could tell the body is powering the way it moves. But there's a kind of, it's definitely a very flowing, graceful method, right? We're not going to, you know, we're not going to disagree on that one, I hope. 
Um, and then we get to the next one, which is the Xingyi one, and notice how vigorous it is. Just, it's very, like, it's just, it, it, you know, it, it, it just, you can tell that that one has a much more direct um, theory behind it and how the sword is used. There's not a lot of, I mean, yeah, there's a few kind of spins in there that some people might find questionable and about how the spins are employed. That's a subject for another video. But in general, notice that the way the sword is used is very brisk. There's not a lot of flowing motion. There's not a lot of almost dance-like movement. It's just get in and kill. It, it, you notice that there's a lot of forward, up, block, chop, forward, stab, thrust. It, it's, it almost looks very basic, but it's very direct and very brisk. And then the last one almost seems to be like an in-between, doesn't it? There's reasons for this. The first one, well, if I'm, if I'm going to be completely blunt and honest about the first one, which, by the way, is one of my... I, I know that's one form that I practice. I really like that form. But that emphasis on the really slow-flowing motion is because these days Wudan is supposed to be the center of internal martial arts. And there's a particular way that people... There's, a, a, there's an image people have in their head on what internal martial arts should look like and how it should feel. It's, it's sort of the same thing that's going on with Shaolin these days where people, especially people who are really into Chinese martial arts, there's a certain image they have in their head on what Shaolin Kung Fu should look like. So a lot of the Shaolin techniques are, they're kind of forcing themselves to look ancient. So there's a lot of like stilted motions and movements in, Chinese, in, in Shaolin long fist forms that is sort of overplayed. It, and this is not saying that it's not effective. It is. But, you know, just to kind of like, to, you know, meet expectations, they're perform when they go through the forms, they're performing it a certain way. It's the same thing with this sword form. But the technique behind it is solid still. And the emphasis here is on slow coiling motions. The application, the way the sword is supposed to be employed with this method is a lot of, you're manipulating the other person's blade a lot. That there's, that's the reason why there's a certain heaviness in the way it's employed. And the smoothness is coming from the way the waist is powering the weapon. If you happen to be meeting the other person's weapon, you're going to be using it to, you're using your waist power, your, the, the, the power of your body movement, to move the weapon out the way, and your body's powering is giving it enough strength so that that person is feeling some force against their blade, like, holy shit, and while their weapon's over there, you can move in for the kill. That's why it has a, that sort of flow to it. But then we go to the Xing Yi one, that second one I showed you. That one is brisk. If you notice, it's just get in. The reason for that is because this is Xing Yi. And if you know anything about Xing Yi, you know it's pretty much a military style. I mean, yeah, it's supposed to be one of the three main internal styles. But there really is no such thing as external and internal. And I know that a lot of people want to say, no, no, no. But the more you study martial arts, the more you begin to realize that all the arts have something internal and external in it. And even then, then you have to figure out, well, what exactly do you mean by internal and external? And that's a conversation for a whole other time. But Xing Yi is pretty much, you can tell it's kind of rooted in certain military, it's a very militaristic style. It's a very direct style. There's not a lot of fanciness to it, not a lot of flim flam. Not a lot of, you know, wasted motion. It's just get in there and kill the guy. And you can see that with this form. There's no daintiness to it. You didn't see a lot of this to it. I mean, yeah, you saw some of the spins, but even the spins, if you notice, were just kind of, yeah, get in there and cut. <laughs> you know, it, and, it's, and the cuts are just like, yeah. but you are you're definitely bringing that blade down. Notice, by the way, also every now and then the guy holding the weapon in two hands. This also kind of betrays its militaristic nature. If you need to put that second hand on there to cut through that dude, then do it. <laughs> You're not just simply keeping one hand here and one hand like that because that's what you do. No. <laughs> that's the mentality. It's just get in there and chop them up. And there's a certain honesty to it. You know, it's just... And there's nothing wrong with that method of using the gen. It is a proper traditional method. Nothing wrong with it. It's not betraying any principles whatsoever. Hell, in fact, there's a certain form called San Kai Dian, which some people say came from Xing Yi. 
It's considered one of the most fundamental sword forms to learn. It's also one of the most practical and gives you a really good idea of how the sword is actually supposed to be used in battle, and it's a no-nonsense form. It's a really cool form. It's divided, into two, it's divided into two parts where one half can be used against the other half, and two students will practice it against each other, and the form is very direct, a lot of motions to the wrist, a lot of move, and there's not a lot of times when the blades meet. It's like the blade's coming at you, and you step out the way and go for an empty spot, go for an open area in the person's body, but I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. The point that I wanted to make is that the Shingi form is just, you could tell the method is done differently. But there's nothing wrong with it. It's not, be it's not wrong. It's just different. And finally, we get to the last one. And the last one is special to me. I really like that last one. Because it doesn't seem to follow any of the stereotypical rules that you expect with the Dian. It's graceful, yes, but not overly so. It's brisk, but not so brisk that it looks like straight up like... <laughs> but it's not... It doesn't look very dance-like, does it? I mean, the way the, the performer is performing it, yet is a little bit of a kind of performance to it, but not really. She's just... you. If you really look at the way she's using the sword, she's just using the sword. Just using it. Just going at it. There's a lot to how this form is being... One thing that I, I personally think, and I could be wrong, but this is a sword form that almost looks folksy to me. And I like folk martial arts styles a lot because they're honest. There's not, they're not just doing things just for show. They're not performing the sword for you. They're not doing it in a way because people expect it to be performed that way. No, they're just, this is the way the sword's used. Hell, the way she's using it, it almost looks like she's swinging a stick. Not quite. There's still there's still a proper slice to the way she does the cut, but but it, she's not overdoing it. There's not an over reliance on the, on that flowing slice, and she's not overselling the chop either. It's just just practical motions, but it almost like she's waving a stick. Notice her left hand also. She's not even doing it like her hands open. Hands open, just just like that. There's a reason why. I want to tell you guys what the reason is, but I want to see if you guys figure it out in the comment section first. If you got a good eye for figuring out technique, and you look at the way she's employing the sword, and you look at how that left hand is moving, you can figure out why that hand's like that. Another reason is simply because, like I said, it's an honest style. They're not just holding this just because of the sake of tradition. I mean, if I'm in the middle of a fight, in real life, there's really no reason to hold your hand like this. You know, so, just keep it open. There's a reason. There's a reason. But notice, again, the, her, her way of employing this weapon is different than the other two forms. But she's not breaking any rules either. She's still employing it in a cut and thrust way. She's, you know, still manipulating the point correctly. She's not using it like a doll. She's not using it like a saber. She's not hacking with it. But it's decidedly different than what some people would expect the way the sword is, is used. So... I'm bringing this up to show people who think that the sword should only be used one way. No. It could be used different ways. Just as long as they're not betraying the principles of how a weapon like that should be used. A, we a sword, at the end of the day, is just a tool. And how you use that tool will depend on what you want to get out of it, as long as you're using the that tool properly to the sense that you're not abusing the weapon or you're not using the weapon in a way that's not effective. Those three methods I showed you are all effective in their own way, but they're not employed exactly the same. Nobody really fights the same. And that's something that people really need to keep in mind when they start trying to define how a sword should be used, especially when it comes to Chinese martial arts. You hear that a lot. But you just got to look at a few forms and you start realizing, wait a minute, they're not employed the same. It's a reason. And hopefully people will figure out what that reason is. Anyway, enough of that. Just hope that you find this amusing. I put up this video just to get some wheels turning in because I think you guys might find it fascinating. But enough of that. Catch you guys later. Every man has these techniques. And they're all different. And when you know mine, You'll be dead. Oh.
guys, looks like I got another one for you. Just thought I'd throw one more in here. So I'm not just tossing this one in here just for the hell of it. Um, this one here is just to give you guys a little bit more food for thought um, when it comes to thinking about the different ways that Chinese swords can be employed, you know, straight swords, the different ways it can be used. This particular form is actually from the um, Tongbei style of Chinese Kung Fu, um, particularly from the Qi branch or the Qi family branch of Tongbei. Um, I don't remember exactly what this particular form was called, um, but it's um, a two-handed sword form, as you can tell. There are a couple of things about it that I want you guys to notice. One, notice that even though it's a two-handed sword form, notice that he does employ it every now and then with one hand. Um, some people who have a good eye may notice that many of the techniques used here are similar to what's used for one hand. And one could probably argue that the two-handed techniques are what later on gave birth to the one-handed techniques that civilians used later. Something else I want you guys to notice is how long this weapon is. I mean, it's a pretty long damn sword, which is not too surprising. I've seen some Chinese two-handed swords with blades as long as 40 inches. And third, long sword guys, take note of some of the techniques that were used here. Um, particularly Skull, Michael Brown, Protherium. I'm pretty sure you guys may have noticed some similar looking techniques as well as some techniques that don't look similar. But just, you know, notice also that this form is done a little bit differently than some of the other ones I've shown, though there are some similarities in its usage. You may, and there are probably some other things you guys may have noticed about it, and just talk about it in the comment section. Not done yet, go guys. Here we go again. Same form, but this time we have the student of the first guy performing it. The reason why I'm showing you the same form is because I want you to notice something. She's performing this form a lot differently than the other guy. I mean, it's the same moves, it's the same form. But she's going through it pretty fast, isn't she? And there's also a little bit more flexibility in her, you know, with her body motions with the technique. Now, one could just chalk this up to youth, you know, but I'm thinking that there's a little bit more to it than that. I'm thinking she personally seems to favor more rapid movement like she really is relying on her swiftness and speed when it comes to using this weapon i got the feeling that if she was actually using the weapon against someone else she would not necessarily just be relying on deliberate motion and on you know flowing power like the first guy seemed to be using like she would definitely be trying to use blinding speed against the opponent like just quickly going in one direction and then just suddenly just changing direction and going you know into another I mean, this, there's a lot more flexibility and swiftness with how she performs it. And, you know, I'm showing this to you guys, showing that even with the exact same style and the exact same form and same methods, it still can be done differently because no two people fight the same. Just something to think about. Later.